they roamed the planet for longer than modern man. Neanderthals. Neanderthals were superb survivors. They survived in a treacherous world. They really dominated Ice Age Europe. Fearless hunters who possessed superior strength and surprisingly advanced tools. It's perhaps one of the most efficient technologies we've ever seen in the entire Stone Age. But then suddenly they vanished, and no one knows why. It's still one of the most wondrous mysteries. Was it a clash with modern humans? This may be the best case of a Neanderthal murder victim. Around the globe, scientists are searching for answers. This is a modern human with Neanderthal features. And they find clues in unlikely places. An ancient volcano site in southern Italy. The ground at the moment is rising. In the Greenland ice sheet, far from the grounds where Neanderthals once settled. There's a cluster in here, thin layers. Mounting evidence reveals a surprising new theory. It was not war with modern man that killed off the Neanderthals. It was an apocalypse. That's ish. That is That's the ish. That might have sealed the fate of our closest human relatives. And what happened to them could easily happen to us. New archaeological evidence has upended our vision of the Neanderthal as a brutish, unintelligent cave dweller. We're just getting a little glimpse of the sophistication that Neanderthals probably had. Neanderthals, it seems, were very much like us. And in one of the world's most remote and inaccessible fossil sites, Archaeologists have unearthed evidence of a far greater connection between our species. In the Carpathian Mountains of Romania, a team of archaeologists is preparing to return to the site of a landmark discovery. A location that proves modern humans and Neanderthals once coexisted together peacefully. The exact location has been withheld to protect the site from fossil hunters. Here in 2002, cavers stumbled on a human jawbone. This led to a three-year excavation conducted by a group of archaeologists trained in cave exploration. It's absolutely pristine. You can study a site which was completely uh, new, undisturbed, which is very, very rare in the life of a scientist. The scientists uncovered evidence that modern humans and Neanderthals may have inhabited the cave at the same time. The team retraces their steps down dark passageways and through an underwater river. As they venture deeper into the mountain, the cave walls narrow and the water rises. There is no other way in the cave except this cold, wet place and very dangerous too. In the murky waters, they feel their way blindly forward, drawing on past experience to guide the way to the other side. Once through, they enter a large cavern with passages to smaller chambers. The team surveys the area. Then they head deeper still towards the chamber that yielded their greatest discoveries. But the route is blocked by high waters that have flooded the cavern below. 
you are in a narrow passage absolutely alone. If you are stuck there somewhere, there is no way to escape. So if something happens, you are dead. Safety concerns forced the scientists to cut this expedition short. But a decade ago, the team made it through the precarious passageway into a remote chamber. This revealing footage is from an expedition in 2003, a mission that paid off. The team enters a chamber deep inside the cave called the Gallery of Bones. The floor is covered with animal bones, the remnants of bear and other large mammals prized by prehistoric hunters. And I've already taken out several in this loose sediment here. But scattered among them are human remains, mostly small fragments of fossilized bones dating back 40,000 years was absolutely crazy. We were, I was so excited about everything around me. The bones in good state of preservation, you, it's absolutely astonishing what is in that cave. On this dig in a dark corner, a team member notices something. That, that looks like human over there, under that long bones. A fragment of a skull. It will become part of a larger landmark discovery. The skull was really something shocking. Very special for the history of uh, humankind. Now housed at the Institute of Speleology in Bucharest, the treasure is kept under lock and key, closely monitored by paleontologist Silviu Constantine. When you look at this skull as a whole, this is a modern human with Neanderthal features. It's that sort of discovery uh, which happens once in a lifetime. This skull was uh, recomposed from 40 pieces. It took Constantine and his team three years to reconstruct the skull and determine the exact features. It has um, a long face, which is not encountered in, uh, in modern humans. The teeth are different too. The size of them is, uh, is too large for, uh, for a modern uh, sapiens. It is much closer to the size of the teeth of a Neanderthal. And then the most telling feature of all. When you look at the back, you find you have this uh, occipital bar. This protrusion shields the occipital lobe, where visual information is processed, the one area where Neanderthal's brain is larger than our own. It's not typical for sapiens, but it's typical for Neanderthals. This may be the missing link, the link between the sapiens and the Neanderthal. For Constantine, the possibilities are tantalizing. Imagine modern humans having love affairs with their Neanderthal neighbors. From this ancient skull, a new image emerges that of modern humans and Neanderthal interbreeding. It is the catalyst for groundbreaking discoveries about the mysteries of our own origins and who we are today. In a Romanian cave, scientists unearth a mysterious skull, a modern human bearing distinct traits of Neanderthal. This raises the question, are we somehow related to Neanderthal? What are our relationships? How do we fit in with the Neanderthals? To me, it's still one of the most wondrous mysteries that we have about our origins, where we came from. At the University of Washington, scientists are searching for traces of Neanderthal in our own DNA. 
DNA is this wonderful, incredible informational molecule. It's, it's almost like reading a book where stories of our past have been written in it. And the challenge right now is sometimes interpreting the words in that book. Coiled up in our cells, long strands of DNA molecules determine and control our traits. A cell's complete set of DNA is our genome. The genome specifies the development of the body plan, of the physiology of the organism. It's what makes humans human and Neanderthals Neanderthal. In 2010, scientists mapped the Neanderthal genome. And when they compared it to the genome of modern man, they made a surprising discovery. Essentially, everybody outside of Africa had Neanderthal ancestry. That number varies a little bit by population, but probably per individual, it's between 1.9 and 2.1% of the genome. Within our own cells, the Neanderthals still live on. We inherited those sequences directly from hybridization, and not because of just shared ancestry that dates back to half a million years ago. The hybridization, or interbreeding, may date back to 60,000 years ago, when modern humans first encountered Neanderthals. The descendants of the hybrid offspring spread, eventually inhabiting much of the globe. But like Neanderthals themselves, never settled in Africa. There was essentially 0% ne Neanderthal ancestry within Africa. Aki and his team have systematically searched for parts of our DNA that we inherited from Neanderthals. In 2014, they compared DNA recovered from Neanderthal bones to the genome of more than 700 living people. What's interesting is that the 2% of my genome that I've inherited from Neanderthals might be different than the 2% that you've inherited. Adding up the different Neanderthal genes carried by people today reveals that much of Neanderthal's genetic legacy lives on. Collectively, about 30% of the Neanderthal genome can still be found in individuals today. But where does our Neanderthal heritage truly show? We found about 10 places in the genome where we inherited a beneficial Neanderthal sequence. And quite strikingly, um, many of these regions contain genes important to hair and skin biology. One example is a gene known to influence skin pigmentation. Among people of European descent, fair skin is a trait possibly inherited from the Neanderthal. So European individuals at this place in the genome are more Neanderthal than they are modern humans. Straight hair may be another Neanderthal trait we inherited. It's clear that, that something about hair or skin biology of Neanderthals was beneficial to our ancestors. Maybe it helped our ancestors survive in these more cold, adapted uh, climates. But not all traits passed down from Neanderthal are necessarily beneficial today. Some studies suggest that Neanderthal sequences in Europeans play an important role in genes that influence fat biology. Today, this ancient trait may be contributing to an obesity epidemic. But in their Ice Age world, this adaptation enabled Neanderthals to build up fat reserves, advancing their survival, and perhaps that of our ancestors as well. As we spread into these new environments, hybridizing with Neanderthals allowed us to pick up versions of genes and sequences that were already sort of adapted to that local environment. And it was a way for our, our ancestors to quickly adapt to these very different environmental conditions. But this only adds to the mystery of Neanderthals' disappearance. If their genetic adaptations helped us survive, why did the Neanderthal perish? climatic causes, population causes, there could be disease causes, there could be differences in the way that you use resources 
as a cause. It really is a mystery why their disappearance took the process that it did. They had a long run, and then they were just gone. One clue may lie with where modern humans and Neanderthals lived. 40,000 years ago, modern humans inhabited Africa, Asia, Europe, even Australia. Their population had grown to a few hundred thousand. Neanderthals never numbered more than a hundred thousand. Confined to areas in Europe and Asia, they were more vulnerable to regional events. The Neanderthals succeeded in that environment. They evolved their special adaptations to cold and they were successful over time there. But at the same time, that was a challenging environment. Is it possible the environment grew too severe, too harsh for even the Neanderthal to bear? This volcanic lake near Down in Germany contains sediment dating to when Neanderthals inhabited the region. A pristine record of the environment going back over 100,000 years. Here, paleoclimatologists from the University of Mainz bore hundreds of feet below the surface to extract sediment core samples. Each layer, only a fraction of an inch thick, is a yearly record of climate and environment captured in mud. What is unique about these core samples is the fact that there is no oxygen at the bottom of the lake, so sediments are undisturbed. We are able to analyze layer after layer and can reconstruct the climate of a single year. Three feet of sediment represents a 1,000-year climate record. Dark layers contain traces of decayed plant life, a sign of times when forests covered the area. Lighter layers mark colder periods, when the land became a barren, frozen expanse. We see here rapid climate changes, warm, then cold. It changes within 10 years. The Neanderthal here lived in a world with open forests and then it's open steppe. Forty thousand years ago, the Neanderthal's world is rapidly disappearing as their traditional hunting grounds turn to hardened permafrost. And the worst is yet to come. Forty thousand years ago, centuries of drastic climate change have ravaged much of Europe, turning Neanderthal hunting grounds into barren fields of icy earth. To the north, countless Neanderthals perish from exposure and starvation. But others turn to one of Neanderthal's oldest survival tactics. They move, sometimes hundreds of miles away from their traditional lands. Far from the protection of caves, Neanderthals erect tents fashioned from hides. Adaptations, survival strategies, and skills developed over the course of 300,000 years see them through the era of drastic cooling and encroaching ice. It was a challenging environment. It was challenging in terms of climate. They were fulfilling those challenges. They survived those challenges. But the centuries of unrelenting climate change do take their toll. They deplete the Neanderthal population to possibly no more than 20,000, pushing the species towards a precarious tipping point. My suspicion is that the population of Neanderthals were probably very highly dispersed in the landscape and, and very, very small. 
And this lends you to the possibility of chance events affecting you, uh, even catastrophic events, could a volcanic eruption or a tsunami uh, if you're on the coast. These things can really have a significant impact when your population is that small. And volcanic eruptions in particular have changed the course of human civilization time and time again. April 10th, 1815. The eruption of Mount Tambora on the island of Sumbawa in Indonesia is the largest volcanic event in recorded history, killing over 10,000 people in its immediate vicinity. The ejected ash and gas circle the earth and block out the sun. The following year is known globally as the year without a summer, causing crops to fail, livestock die off, all told, an estimated 90,000 people perish worldwide. Lake Ilopango. In 535 AD, a volcanic eruption in El Salvador buried 4,000 square miles in three feet of ash, stopping all agriculture for a decade, nearly wiping out civilization in Central America. But Lake Ilopango or Mount Tambora are not the only global volcanic disasters, nor are they the largest. Lake Toba, Indonesia. This is a super volcano, one of nature's deadliest killers. Its placid waters cover a collapsed caldera, spanning across 440 square miles. 74,000 years ago, molten rock and superheated gases expanded until the Earth's crust could no longer withstand the pressure. The blast produces a mushroom cloud of sulfuric acid and gas, a hundred times greater than the Mount Tambora blast. That catastrophic eruption changed the climate, probably wiped out a lot of populations in that area. It spreads ash across Asia, the Arabian Peninsula, and even Africa. India, over a thousand miles from the blast, is buried in up to 18 feet of debris. The Mount Toba eruption altered the environment for decades, if not centuries to come, with deadly consequences. You could have a perfectly genetically fit population which could disappear overnight because of a volcanic eruption. And no matter how fit genetically they are, they've gone, and they've gone forever. Did a volcanic eruption seal the Neanderthal's fate? The Greenland ice sheet may provide the answer. The ice here forms a frozen vault, locked within its layers, years of ancient climate data. So we're flying over the mountains, it takes us right up to Kangaroo Swag. It's really beautiful. Accessible by special Air Force transporters, the Summit Camp Research Center sits at an altitude of 10,000 feet, atop a literal mountain of ice. Here, scientists like Jim White drill thousands of feet down to extract core samples from deep below. Imagine that snow never melted. Imagine that snow just keeps piling up and piling up and piling up. In places like Greenland, where we have a meter of snow per year accumulating, those records go back maybe 150, 160,000 years. But that's certainly a long enough period of time for us to really get a good snapshot of what the Neanderthal had to deal with. When extracted, Gases and sediments trapped in the ice will paint a vivid picture of our planet's history. We measure temperature, things like the amount of dust that comes in, the composition of the atmosphere, how much methane, how much CO2. So if there's a very large volcano that goes off, it puts ash in the atmosphere, it also puts sulfate in the atmosphere. And if some of that sulfate falls, as it probably will, in a place like Greenland or Antarctica, 
we're able to go back and measure that and say, yes, there was a volcano at that time. Ice cores retrieved from the Greenland ice sheet are taken to a deep freeze storage thousands of miles away. The National Ice Core Lab in Denver, Colorado. It houses 60,000 feet of ice core samples waiting to be analyzed. This is, uh, this is a Fort Knox of ice cores. This is our gold, if you will. This is the most precious stuff we have. Geologist Jim White has secured access to an ice core sample from the approximate time of Neanderthal's disappearance. So that's the core from uh, roughly 39,000 years ago. Yep. Yeah. Okay. White has been at the forefront of ice core research since the 1980s. He knows how to interpret clues hidden within this frozen history. So the, the Neanderthal were alive when this snow fell, which is kind of cool and very interesting. This time, he's looking for chemicals and compounds linked to volcanic eruptions. Ash, shards of volcanic rock, sulfur compounds, all distinct markers of an eruption may be trapped within this ice core. This one has several bands. There's a couple of nice thick layers that may be potentials for the uh, volcanic event. Yeah, so you can see uh, there's a cluster in here, uh, thin layers. Uh, and another one right back in here. The clusters are unusual. They appear to be dark bands of microscopic deposits suspended in the ice. When we run that in the lab, we'll, we'll watch for that. Okay. That's something interesting. Back in the lab, the ice core is melted, layer after layer. What actually is happening here is we're peeling off week by week, month by month, year by year, the snow that fell. And that's then going into the machine and being measured. It's like uh, leafing through the pages of a book, one page at a time. In this particular case, uh, we're probably looking at uh, one year for every 10 centimeters or so. so. So it's a pretty detailed record that we're getting. Particles and chemicals previously trapped in the ice are isolated and evaluated. I can imagine that the Neanderthals would have been very much surprised by everything they see here, but probably no more so than surprised by the fact that we know what's going to happen to them. Finally, the ice reveals its long hidden secret, remnants of a volcanic eruption. We can see the sulfate from the eruption. We don't see ash or anything in Greenland, but we can see the sulfate from that eruption. And we know that it occurs right at that same time where you have this very sharp cooling in the ice core, right in here. A clear indicator of a massive eruption with far-reaching consequences. That was a volcanic event that was certainly one of the largest in the last couple hundred thousand years. That would be a, a very challenging time to live. Is this the smoking gun? Could it finally explain the mystery of Neanderthal's disappearance? In the south of Italy, scientists investigate the possible culprit, one of the largest volcanoes in the world and the largest in Europe. This sleeping giant is known to have erupted 39,000 years ago, and it may be waking up again, threatening the lives of millions today. The gas flux in this area has increased dramatically in the last few years. There is a urgency to monitor continuously. Naples, Italy stands on shaky ground. Mount Vesuvius looms six miles away. But Vesuvius is not the greatest threat to the area's four million residents. A much larger, deadlier volcano rages practically underfoot. Campi Flegri, Europe's largest and most dangerous volcanic site. Its caldera is eight miles wide, most of it hidden under the surface of the Mediterranean Sea. This is a supervolcano. 
At the Volcanology Observatory in Naples, scientists scrutinize every inch of the raging cauldron. Tidal gauges measure the exact level of the seabed, while seismographs search the ground for any signs of underground quakes. There is a need, an, an urgency to, to monitor. If to imagine inside the caldera, there is a population of about a half a million of people that live here. Within the caldera, noxious sulfuric gases rise from cracks in the surface. In pools, volcanic mud boils, superheated to over 300 degrees. Scientists register alarming signs of activity. As cracks in this area has increased dramatically in the last few years. The ground at the moment is rising, yeah. There is a urgency to monitor continuously. In the past 30 years, the ground around Campi Flegri has risen by more than six feet. The volcano is so active, it has already forced residents from their homes. Follow me. I'll show you a very interesting phenomenon. In this abandoned building, you can see how aggressive are these sulfur components. Wow. Sulfur and gas have forced their way up through the floor and into the walls. 90 degrees, bro. No, more, more. I think even 100. <laughs> but the most troubling signs are further afield. In the hills nearby Naples, Antonio Costa and Roberto Isaiah are searching for remnants of the volcano's violent past traces of an ancient eruption that may be linked to Neanderthal's extinction. So, this is the affioramento that you said, you see? And this, this is the layer that we have talked about before, yeah? this one. These cliffs are over 200 feet high. They're composed of volcanic debris deposited during a single eruption. Their height alone points to the sheer power of this blast. That's the ash. That is the ash. Ash from this cliff has been carbon dated to approximately 39,000 years ago, the time of Neanderthal's disappearance throughout most of the world. Ashes like this, very fine ashes like this, you can imagine we're going around in the, all the eastern Mediterranean, very far from, from the Campi Flegrei area. But was this eruption powerful enough to wipe out the Neanderthal? I think that an eruption in Italy could have been significant. My question then would be, what is the extent, the geographical area, is it greater than we, we've suspected? The answer may lie in the ash. Scientists can gauge the strength of an eruption by measuring the thickness of ash layers in locations far from the volcano. In Romania, 700 miles away from Campi Flegri, geologist Daniel Verez searches for ash from the ancient eruption. A clue to the blast's power and perhaps the cause of Neanderthal's extinction. He's joined by fellow geologist Ulrich Humbach. Let me take a sample and have a closer look. It's, not really, it's much lighter than the less. I think it can be a volcanic ash done. Really? It does. Yep. Has the consistency. Yeah, has the consistency. Hambach and Veris are one of several teams investigating the size and impact of the Flegri blast. This ash may get them one step closer to the answer. The thickness of the ash at this particular spot is one meter and ten centimeters. 
and it's even increasing. To the left, to the, to the center of the depression, which is at the moment covered here by the debris. By measuring the layer's height, they can begin to calculate the power of the blast. Here, over 700 miles away, the volcano dumped four feet of ash on the region. I mean, this is a very unexpected find. The eruption that created this particular layer must have been of a very powerful magnitude. If this is the eruption of the Phlegrean fields in southern Italy, as we suppose it is, it certainly proves that that eruption, which was considered as the largest in the last 200,000 years, has been likely even of higher amplitude than expected. Vérez and Hambach are not alone in this work. Throughout the Mediterranean, up to Russia and into Asia, scientists have collected and measured ash dated to 39,000 years ago. Samples are sent to the University of Bayreuth in Germany. Here, Ulrich Hambach analyzes them to determine if they originated from the Campi Flegri eruption. All volcanic ash has a specific chemical fingerprint that is unique to the blast that deposited it. Using an electron scanner and an X-ray beam, Hambach and his colleagues create a specific chemical profile of each sample. We are really curious and we hope uh, that the results will match the eruption in Italy. The tests reveal the chemical components of the ash samples. Each sample has an identical chemical profile, a profile that matches a single eruption, the Campi Flegri blast. It's the same for the sites we investigated, and it's the same for the sites colleagues investigated from Russia down to Libya. The research shows the terrifying scale of the blast. The eruption spread ash across three continents, encompassing large swaths of the territory where Neanderthal once lived. Back at the Naples Volcano Observatory, Antonio Costa is preparing a computer simulation of the Campi Flegri eruption. Once complete, it will reveal exactly what happened 39,000 years ago. At the observatory in Naples, Antonio Costa and Roberto Isaiah are generating a computer simulation of the Campi Flegri eruption 39,000 years ago, the cataclysm linked to Neanderthal's extinction. The simulation reveals the sheer power of the eruption. For the first time, we were able to estimate even the duration of this eruption. We estimated that the eruption lasted between two and four days. Using this simulation, the scientists can piece together what happened 39,000 years ago. The Campi Flegri volcano looms above the land. It will soon come crashing down. Neanderthals nearby feel the first signs of an imminent eruption, a barrage of tremors emanating from the volcano. It's the most powerful eruption in Europe in the last 200,000 years. Pyroclastic flows burst from the volcano, rampaging over a 40-mile range. The cascade of gas and molten rock superheated to over 1,500 degrees, travels at speeds approaching 500 miles per hour. Obviously, where the pyroclastic flows arrived, there were no chance for any kind of life to survive. Everything was buried under meters and meters of flows. A 
a mushroom cloud of volcanic gas and fiery debris rises into the Earth's atmosphere. A thick layer of ash engulfs much of southern and eastern Europe. Within days, the cloud spreads to Central Asia and the Middle East. But where the modern human population is spread around the globe, Neanderthals are confined to Europe and Central Asia, the regions most impacted by the blast. For most, there is no hope of escape. Four million of square kilometers were covered by at least half a centimeter of ash. The cloud of debris blocks the sun for weeks. Ash rains down on an area that stretches from Russia to North Africa. So conditions in Europe at that time were already very difficult. Then on the top of this condition, we had a volcanic winter. In the ash zone, Neanderthals and modern humans face a slow and torturous death. Even half a centimeter of ash is able to, to kill completely the, the small vegetation that existed at the time. The smothering ash blocks sunlight and oxygen. It also contains high levels of fluorine, a deadly chemical for plant life. When vegetation die, animals die, and the humans as well don't have a source of food. Many Neanderthal wither away and slowly die from starvation. Others develop symptoms of severe fluorine poisoning, chronic fatigue, nausea, and eventually death. The first ones to die are the children, and the elderly. But deprived of food and light, even the strong do not survive for long. Vast forested lands where Neanderthals lived for millennia are now desolate, inhabited by dying members of a doomed species. In areas like in the Eastern Europe, we had to wait for sure century for that ecosystem to flourish and go back as it was. Across much of Europe, modern humans and Neanderthals are completely wiped out. Only Neanderthals on the outer reaches of their territory survive. The place they survive the longest, the Rock of Gibraltar. For another 15,000 years, they live on as they always have, unaware they are the last of their kind. So they just carried on living their day-to-day -day lives as best they could, and gradually their numbers dwindled, dwindled, and one day they just disappeared. Leaving behind their caves and their remains for our own species to discover. A species that could face the same fate. Today, 39,000 years after the catastrophic eruption, Campi Flegri continues to rage. Another super eruption is not likely to happen anytime soon. But if it happens, it could decimate an entire continent. And volcanologists are on high alert. The gas composition has changed recently and uh, has more uh, magmatic components. We monitor it routinely every two weeks. And even for those who live far away from this monster, there's every reason to be alarmed. This is by no means the only active supervolcano, or the most dangerous. Supervolcanoes dot the globe, 23 total, threatening populations on almost every continent. And the most powerful of all is in the United States. Northwest Wyoming. Yellowstone National Park spans over 3,000 square miles of pristine wilderness, untamed wildlife, and unique natural wonders. The park contains half of the world's geysers, one sign of the violent forces raging beneath the surface. This is the world's largest active supervolcano. Yellowstone has produced three eruptions in the last 
2.1 million years, at least two of which would easily qualify for a super eruption, and perhaps all three. Park geologists estimate that the volcano erupts every 600 to 800,000 years. The last time was 640,000 years ago. Yellowstone is due for another blast. We know that the magma chamber is close to a point at which it could be eruptible. Based on US geological survey projections, an eruption would have catastrophic consequences. Searing ash and molten rock would surge across the land, destroying everything for miles. Billions of tons of volcanic debris would jettison upward into the atmosphere, forming a vast cloud of ash. Carried by the wind, it would travel over 2,000 miles from the blast zone, enveloping most of North America in a coat of ash. Super eruption would literally change the face of North America. There would be ash accumulations we couldn't deal with. There would be infrastructure costs, which would be uh, prohibitively high, so we would have to be very careful, prioritize how we rebuilt. Uh, these are, the, are some of the obvious things. Across the country, crops and livestock would perish, depriving North America of food. Noxious sulfur compounds would poison the water supply. Buried in ash and debris, roads and infrastructure would be obliterated, cutting off the lifeline to major cities on the East Coast and relief for survivors of the cataclysm. In a matter of weeks, the world's greatest superpower would crumble, and the devastation wouldn't be confined to North America. Super eruptions uh, put up a tremendous amount of material into the atmosphere. That could definitely be felt globally. Around the world, the sun would appear to dim, its light diffused by volcanic debris lingering in the high atmosphere. It's a precursor to the darkest phase of the cataclysm. Volcanic winter, a period of cooling that can last for years. Experts believe a Yellowstone eruption would result in the devastation of global agriculture and lead to severe food shortages and mass starvation. It would threaten the very fabric of civilization. It would be a changed planet. But I think the human endeavor is resilient. I have great faith in our ability to survive these kinds of things. And the chances are we would live on, for the same reason our species survived the eruption that doomed the Neanderthals. We inhabit every corner of the globe. We can withstand a cataclysm that devastates two continents. Neanderthals, a species without our global reach, could not. I think in the end, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, and one population made it, which is us. They did not die out because they were intellectually inferior. They lived lives that were very much like the lives that people live now. They didn't have some of the ways that we organize large societies, but when you look at what they achieved with those limitations, it's very human. They roamed the planet for 100,000 years longer than modern humans so far. Certainly if there was a Hall of Fame of humanity, uh, the Neanderthals would make that Hall of Fame. In a sense, we owe them our lives. We should be pretty grateful to Neanderthals because they helped us survive and reproduce as we migrated out of Africa into these new environments. So they played an important role in human evolution. And so, their legacy lives on within us. Perhaps we can say that we have met the Neanderthals and they are us. The Neanderthals reigned for 300,000 years. Whether we survive as long is a big unknown. I think it's a matter of chance and uh, like I often say, you know, if, if it had gone another way, you know, we would be Neanderthals now talking about the extinction of the other people. I don't think we'd be able to recognize the Neanderthals today if they were just out on the street. 
not only would they probably succeed in modern society, at some professions they probably would have been better than even us. We are the sole human species on the planet. But the Neanderthal do live on in our DNA, perhaps strengthening our ability to cope with the challenges of life on Earth and survive when they could not. <laughs>